so it's not speed, it's the ability to change direction while being fast, basically, right? And if I would apply that to the business context, the body becomes the company's product, strategy, and position in the market, right? So when we speak about agility, what we mean is, oh, if the market decides, yeah, your product that you've been selling for 20 years, now there's this new thing on the block, we don't want this anymore. Okay, what do you do, right? If all your processes are super rigid and uh, locked onto your current business strategy, it's gonna be hard to switch, right? And there's a lot of big behemoths that die because of this, right? because they don't have enough flexibility in the processes to actually change the direction of the company to modify a product or to venture into a new business, uh, change their business model, this kind of stuff. Um, but even at the smaller scale, uh, if you're trying to develop a product in a small startup with four or five people, but you're doing monthly long sprints, yeah, uh, you get the customer feedback three weeks in, oh, actually this feature is not necessary, let's do this other one, or well, you just wasted three weeks, right? Whereas if you do weekly sprints, well, maybe you just wasted one week instead, right? Um, so this is the this is what you want basically when you're thinking of DevOps, yeah. Like the reason why we moved from on-premise servers and uh, Jenkins and Ansible and all these things that we had to do manually before, and uh, having your Linux computers that you had to maintain yourselves to ah, let's just write a few lines of Terraform code and Terraform apply, and then poof, we have a computer now. But right? why did we do this? Well, it's because it's it's faster to change the decision, right? Oh, you want a computer? Okay, let's pay by the minute, and here's a computer. And now, okay, I don't want a computer anymore, bang, it's out. Instead of hiring a sysadmin, buying the machine, machine comes in a few weeks, and then, oh, I don't want a computer anymore, well, okay, now I have to fire someone. Like, you see that the processes become much more heavy in terms of time and money and energy. Um, so this is basically why we migrated to this, right? And so, what I've been trying to say is that business agility is really the true objective behind the philosophy. It has a lot of positive side effects, but if it wasn't for this, businesses would not have adopted DevOps. That's basically where it comes from, at least in my opinion. You're welcome to disagree. <laughs> um, so, basically when you have a better work culture, your problems get predicted and solved quickly, uh, quicker when you work as a team, right? If someone figures out something but doesn't say it to anybody else, or doesn't want to communicate to anybody else, then maybe the information doesn't go into the hands of the person that realizes that there's a problem, right? So um, this is one of the consequences. Uh, automation, imagine that you have a sequence of steps, let's say 10 steps, right? Uh, and they're all automated. And now all of a sudden uh, something changes in the business, you want to change one of those steps. Or if these things are all programmed, and well decoupled, then you just go at that step, you change what you need to change, and that's it. Whereas, if half of those steps are manual and the other half needs to be done with a meeting, then changing that thing means you have to set up a meeting to decide on the new process, and then assign the job of reorganizing this thing to other people, and it becomes slow and painful, and nobody wants to do it, and sometimes it never gets done, right? Um, so, lean, I've already mentioned a little bit about it. Uh, measurement as well. I don't want to repeat myself, it's just uh, everything's already there. And uh, yeah, sharing, like imagine that uh, the business is changing direction and three teams need to change one of their processes, right? Uh, if the business only communicates to one team and the one team is not aware that the other two need to change something, well, now we have like a lag between uh, the previous process and the new process, right? So you have three teams, one team is ahead and the other two are like a version behind. And then uh, you get kinds of problems that you wouldn't even be able to imagine sometimes. Um, so going back to our original Google search, right? Um, basically now, because we understand what DevOps actually means, what is MLOps becomes the DevOps philosophy, meaning columns, right, apply to machine learning software processes. Um, okay, so I'm going to go on and dive into details of um, what that actually means a bit more concretely. 
But first of all, are there any questions um, so far? Okay, let's just keep going. Then. So the first one, culture. <clears throat> so let's say you're building a new uh, company, right? Uh, let's say it's an AI startup, and you have this idea that with machine learning, you're going to break into this new market. And that's the idea of the CEO, starts hiring a machine learning engineer, or an MLOps engineer, and then that's you, right? And then they come to you and say, okay, uh, what's the plan? I want this. And you say, okay, I'll be done in six months. If that's what you say, they have no idea what to do with you, right? They close their eyes and they wait. So if you need something from them, well, it comes as a surprise, right? So it's much better to think, okay, this person came to me with this problem and they think the solution is a machine learning algorithm. Let's have a conversation with them. Okay, you want this machine learning algorithm to do this. If you vulgarize what's actually happening behind the scenes, maybe the idea that they preconceived in their head is not at all, not at all what you're thinking of doing, right? So having this discussion to clarify what's actually gonna happen and what are the implications for them makes your life much more easier. You know, to give you an idea, I tried to build a chapel company for 15 months and after 15 months, my first customer asked me to build three chatbots that required no machine learning at all. And the statement that he gave me for saying why he wants those chatbots was, I want to understand if our company can um, develop in the space of machine learning. So you can imagine the frustration, spending a year and then realizing that you're talking to someone who doesn't know what you're doing, right? Um, you can save yourself a lot of time, money, and pain by just doing this one point. Making sure that your colleagues, uh, team members, and stakeholders actually understand what's at stake. Focus on the company objectives when building models, not on the models themselves. What does that mean? It means if you have a problem that you're trying to solve by defining some algorithm, the algorithm itself is not the end goal, it's just the solution to the problem. So make sure that you understand the problem really well from basically all possible perspectives. From the point of view of your company, from the point of view of the user that's going to use the model, from the point of view of the people that have to be involved, right? So let's say your model uh, requires some company data to be annotated before it starts uh, the training process. Well, these might be internal people, these might be external people, maybe you're using something like um, Mechanical Turk or something like that from Amazon, um, or there are services these days, depending on the data that you're processing, that annotate the data for you. Um, you need to understand all these topics to see where, what kind of problems are going to arise and what kind of solution you at least plan to develop when the time comes. Because if you just do that, uh, maybe the company decides like, oh, okay, this is actually too expensive or this will take too long. So let's switch completely the strategy. And then you just save yourself a lot of pain, right? Um, but let's say that works, right? Let's say the company is on board. Then it's much easier to outline the timeline and to keep the stakeholders up to date on what's happening. And the whole strategy of the company now gets aligned with that. They're on board. They understand what's happening. They know what to expect. They know what to do with their own timelines, right? And that's much more productive than just going blind for six months and then showing like, hey, I have something for you guys to do, right? This happens a lot, it's not, it's not just a funny statement. Um, yeah, and this goes a little bit into the third point, like you want to persuade the people, the processes and technology to deliver trusted, high quality data for training your models quickly, right? So, um, depending on where the data comes from, it needs to be annotated, uh, if there's some governance issues, like maybe you need to be GDPR compliant to process that data, so you need to anonymize some things on top, you need to aggregate some data. Um, these things might, should not be done by you, ideally, or should not be done by the machine learning engineers in your team if you're just responsible for the MLOps part. Because in small teams, oftentimes, the people doing the deployment and production and the engineers may be the same people. They're just roles, right? They can be assigned to the same person. Um, so it's really important to get that figured out, at least at a high level, before you like, think of like, writing down an algorithm, right? 
Um, okay, automation. So this is the part that um, is easy to get wrong. And what usually happens when a model doesn't go to production is that one or more of these steps are basically like not known or ignored, right? And then you realize that you need too much time to go to production. Uh, when you're in production, you have too many problems, and so the model deteriorates over time. And so these are the few, uh, let's say, tips that I have um, so far. Um, you want to facilitate the deployment, right? So let's say you've worked on Google Colab or AWS SageMaker or any kind of um, trained as a service provider, let's say, uh, and then you have your model, right? So how do you make sure that that model goes on a server where it can actually be reached by the other services that the company is, is using, right? So you want to automate that part, right? To make sure that um, this process, every time the model gets retrained, doesn't need to be redone manually, which happens a lot. Um, infrastructure is code, safety pipelines, this is where the typical stuff that DevOps engineers would do, right? That's where it happens. Um, going on a little bit uh, after that, so uh, make sure that like your machine learning model when it's sitting behind the server, um, if ETLs need to be connected to it to um, feed the data from its source for, for um, live predictions, let's say, uh, or if the data needs to be cached before the users actually um, use the predictions, a good example would be a search engine. So you could think of a, an example of a model I worked on, for instance, was that uh, we had data from uh, our providers of the product, and then we would run the, the machine learning model on, on those, that data, and that data would be stored in a database, and the user would just use that data like an index uh, for speeding up searches and, and uh, getting recommendations. So that means that there needed, there needed to be some process that, um, when we deployed a new version of the model, that would automatically go through the data that we had and then create that index, right? This is not something that you just deploy the model and then, okay, it's accessible, so the process is gonna run. No, there, there's like processes around the fact that you have a new model that need to be run, and these need to be orchestrated, right? Um, so this is kind of, a, these are like two specific points and this kind of general point. You want to reduce the friction in the model's life cycle. So you need to train the model, you need to deploy the model, you need to use new versions of the model to run it on maybe live data or data that is available at the moment of deployment. Um, and all these things, if they're done manually, they take time, they might be skipped because of deadlines. Uh, and depending on the business model, the things that create more friction might be very different, right? Um, so like for instance, if you're running on live data versus learn, uh, if you're predicting on live data versus predicting on uh, data ahead of time, your process is gonna be completely different, right? Um, and so also depending on the team, depending on what they're good at, depending on what they've already automated maybe, when you show up, it's pretty simple. You just go ask them like, look, what's costing you a lot of time? What are you not doing because you think it's too long? And then you try to reduce these things first, right? Instead of automating, what you think is the best practice, start with the ones that actually cause pain, right? Um, second slide for it, because I have a lot to say. <laughs> um, so your model, when you train it, typically what's gonna happen, let's say it's not like a simple linear regression, but something a bit more complicated, maybe a deep neural net. Um, you're gonna have a data set, and then this data set is gonna be pre-processed and then used for training and then maybe in the training process there's like random seed generators, uh, you have a train test split, you have a bunch of things that are random. So you want to uh, make some hyperparameters as well. So all these things uh, can be saved as configuration to be able to repeat the experiment. And there's many reasons why you want to be able to repeat it. First of all, just to confirm that you didn't get lucky, right? Your algorithm is not working because, oh, it works on my machine, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, but also, let's pretend that in production there's a bug, and one potential source of the bug is the model, right? So if you cannot repeat the experiment, maybe you just retrain, and then you realize, oh, okay, the problem is gone. Maybe it was the model, maybe it wasn't. Especially when you're dealing with statistical engines, maybe you just got lucky. So it's important to actually know what happened, and making things reproducible 
enable you to basically debug, right? Um, so, um, you want to automate the data flow required to create data for training and testing. So what that means is, let's say the data is sitting on Google Analytics, right? You want to train the customer data. And then there's a whole process. You need to query it, you need to anonymize it, you need to aggregate it, and then you need to do a train test split. So if this is always done manually, and you need to retrain, I don't know, uh, if your model is not that complicated or complex, let's say, maybe you need to retrain 20 times a week, right, during the research process to figure out what's the best model, well, automating it the first time sounds like something you want to do, right? Uh, saving, yourself, uh, saving yourself time of doing something you do 20 times pays off quite well. Um, and then there's the other side of it, right? Your model's been built, uh, you're deploying it, but then the rest of your company actually wants to use that model. Maybe you use it for business intelligence, for data science experiments, maybe they use it for analytics, maybe they use it for the actual product. Um, there's plenty of use cases for that, and you don't want to communicate with those teams and tell them like, hey, by the way, can you go and do this task for me, because now the new model is live. It's much simpler if you just automate that, and then you tell them like, look, uh, you received an update, send them maybe an alert, and then they know what to do with that, right? So, um, I just want to add like, of course these sound like things that might be very time consuming to do, um, but think of the points that I'm making here not as a, if you don't do this, you're not doing ML ops, but more like, these are like points to go in the direction of understanding the philosophy better and applying it more and more gradually in your company, right? Uh, if I would say tomorrow you need to apply all those points, that wouldn't be very lean, right? Uh, iterating small steps, that's kind of the idea of the whole thing. So maybe you start with the one that is most painful, and then you move on and find the ones that apply most to you. So speaking of lean, um, yeah, so you look at the life cycle of your model, and depending on your business, the algorithm you're trying to define, the data that you have, there might be uh, certain points in that process that are more or less time consuming, right? So if you break down those steps, and you can use like a, I mean, I, I, I imagine that most of you are aware of like diagram software like Draw.io or something like that. You can break down the process and then uh, basically assign, okay, this part is done by, let's say, this script or this third party application or this person in the team, right? Um, and then you break down these steps and then you realize that, okay, this is super time consuming, this not that much, this is fine for now, it could be better. But this is taking me one hour a day, this is taking me three weeks, right? So let's start with the bigger one. And then um, the other thing to realize is like, let's say you're trying to define the product and uh, you see like, oh, we could use machine learning for this, we could use machine learning for that, and this, and that, and that. Machine learning should be thought as an expensive solution, right? It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of money, it takes a lot of energy. Um, I mean, unless you're trying to just build a simple linear regression, in which case it's as expensive as um, basically rule-based algorithm these days, um, being more like the deep learning, computer vision kind of approach, right? Uh, this is not something that you just sprinkle on all your problems, right? You need to carefully invest this, um, and if some of these problems in your product definition could be solved by simpler problems at the beginning, then basically like solving them with these simpler approaches and then investing in making the product more complex to better accommodate, let's say, the end user of the software uh, is a much more linear way of doing things. So to give you an example, let's say you, you're looking for your first customer, right? And you're thinking like this AI product is going to be the new hot product on the market. Uh, if you start by solving all the problems of your one customer, and they're not paying yet. Well, maybe slow down a bit, right? Maybe think, okay, what, talk to your customer and say, what's your most painful problem that you have right now, right? And then it's, okay, this part, let's, let's sign a contract for this, or let's have a POC for this, right? And then you have a little bit of budget, you have something you can focus on, and then when this works, you go back to your customer, they're happy, they want more, and then you iterate, right? So, okay, next point. Um, okay, let's say you're working with, 
a much bigger customer, right? We're not talking startups anymore. Uh, maybe like uh, autonomous driving, something like that, where you already know, like, okay, you're dealing with terabytes, petabytes, or something bytes, much bigger. And then you want to train them all on that, right? Uh, if your training process takes two, three, four weeks, um, what most of you probably already know about, like, let's say, Spark, right, to be able to parallelize processes, um, instead of training on the same set of GPUs for multiple weeks, you can think, okay, maybe I can train multiple models on multiple machines and have my data center completely distributed, and then you can parallelize these things and then shorten the life cycle by a lot, right? Um, I gave the example of training, but of course it's going to be done with like, multiple methods. Um, yeah, do not reinvent the wheel, right? Um, one mistake that I've seen done by other people, including uh, and myself, is that I was thinking like, oh, this problem looks really complicated. Let's invent this new crazy algorithm because with my new crazy algorithm, I could solve the problem. Yeah. Uh, usually, by a bit of research, you know, you find something on AutoML or Keras or I don't know what, and you can just dot fit, put your data in there, and then you get a result today, right? Um, this might be tempting to do, and might make you feel like you maybe have some power, or that you're now more important to the company because you managed to do this, and yeah. you can do this because you're the first one to do it ever. Um, that doesn't last, yeah? That feeling doesn't last forever. Whereas the feeling of actually providing value to the company, if you keep doing this over and over, that will definitely last. So, um, measurement. Right. Um, so you're developing your model, and then you have your dashboard that tells you about maybe the mean error of your model, and then the variance of the error, and then you have an idea of how accurate you are, precise you are, you have all your metrics, precision, recall, all this stuff, right? But the business doesn't even know what that means. Like you talk to them and say, yeah, okay, I have a low F score. They might have like, okay, what about the G score or the H score? Yeah, they don't know what they're saying. Um, so you need to basically figure out like what matters for the rest of the business. Because you know what matters, right? You can think like, uh, I have my statistics and so on. But what the business actually cares about to determine if they actually want to use this, well, they want to know like, okay, I had uh, these 50 people in my company that wanted to, that had to annotate the data. Uh, are the predictions on the unobtainted data actually decent, right? Or do I have a 20% error rate? And I have to deal with a huge error rate so that I don't know what to do with. Um, you want to know uh, the model performance on live data, because maybe you did your train test split, yeah? And then on your training data and test data, you performed super well, you go to production, and then there's some bug, the data comes in wrong, and then predictions are horrible, right? Maybe there's nothing wrong with your model, but if the output of your model is wrong, then you want to know. If you don't know, then you're in big trouble. Um, data drift. So this can happen, for instance, if you have an uh, ML solution that applies on a seasonal context. So I mentioned earlier I was CTO in a fashion startup. Um, basically, the, one of the models that I built was about extracting features out of product images. So people like would have an image of someone who wore clothes, or earrings, or shoes and then the model would extract features out of that. Um, but the clothes in the summer are not the same as the ones in the winter. So if I train a, mo a model on summer data, and then I apply it on winter products, the results don't even make sense, right? Um, so you need to be able to measure like at what point is your model actually uh, underperforming compared to what you've seen when you were training it, right? Um, or just basic errors thrown during processing. So let's say you assumed uh, your image processing model was going to expect like an image of this format, and then suddenly something like this gets thrown in, and then all the matrices in the deep learning model go like, oh, you know, the dimension errors, you don't know what's happening, right? So you want to see this in production, because maybe uh, it has nothing to do with your model. Maybe it's just because you expected that, and then you wrote an ETL expecting that, and then the user decided like, oh, okay, you said to put this image format in there, but I'm gonna give you something else, right? If this happens once, you might say, let's just talk to that person. But if it happens 50% of the time, maybe there's something wrong with the product, right? Maybe it wasn't explained properly or designed properly, or maybe we just need to make a model that actually fits that use case, 
right? So measuring these things basically raises the right questions that you wouldn't otherwise not have and not know what to do. Um, and so how do you figure out those questions, right? Because maybe, like, I'm the best example. You don't see me as a fashionista, yet I was working in a fashion company. So I had to ask a lot of questions, right? Um, they were coming up with these features that they wanted me to extract. I had no idea what they meant, but I had some numbers to crunch. So I was like, okay, let's do it, right? Um, and by talking to the different teams, I could actually figure out what they want, right? So if they want to know um, what products, let, let, so to give you the context, like um, it was a, it was the model was used as a recommendation engine. So basically, imagine that you like. Um, a pair of shoes, so you buy a pair of shoes, it goes with your suit, it's very fancy, very formal, right? And then the next day you come and you want a tie, right? Or you want a shirt. Well, the shirt that you're going to buy after buying shoes is not going to be the same shirt after you buy a bikini or something, right? So we wanted to make sure that these kinds of products sort of came on top. And then they actually didn't want to know, let's say, the top 50 products that came on top. They wanted to know the top three. Why? Because they're the ones that show up on the page when you open the website. So if I hadn't asked, I would have just given them statistics like, oh yeah, on average, the first 50 products, they look okay. And then they would try the product and be like, no. <laughs> right? So these are the kinds of questions that like, you don't have the answer. Right? The, the answer doesn't come from you. It comes from domain knowledge or it comes from um, teams that do something specific with the data that you're handling. Right? And the only way to really figure out what you actually have to measure is by asking. And then finally sharing. So, okay, so you've asked your teammates, you've asked your colleagues, you've asked the CEO or management, okay, these are the measurements that you want. And you actually produce those measurements, but then they need to have access. Because if you're the one sending emails every day, uh, you're not gonna like your job. Here. Right? Um, so you want to make sure different teams have access to the data surrounding the model to act accordingly and know what to do with it. So if you need data annotation on the data that you're receiving, uh, do the annotators actually know what to do with it? Are they using the labels that you want them to use? Or are they saving the labels properly? Maybe they're saving them in the wrong format. Let's say the label is a date. We all know that dates can be super painful. Right? So. Um, yeah, document as much as possible. I mean, we keep saying it, documentation is important. But the documentation, you should see it as something that is not just for others. It can also be about yourself, right? So let's say you haven't documented something that you've done manually because you're thinking like, ah, this is a one-time thing. And one week later, you have to do it again. Okay, I haven't documented it this time, but it's a one-time thing, it's fine. Two-time thing, okay, so you do it again manually. And then third time, okay, now I've been doing this three times, but I don't have the time to automate it because I don't know how to do this. But you don't document. Which means that every time you have to do it again, you spend 10 minutes doing it, and then now we're figuring out how to do it. Right? So not only if you do this, you become more productive because you actually have a way to remember and save yourself all the research, uh, but you can ask someone else to do it. Right? And then you become less of a bottleneck and a bit more redundant. And yeah, let's say you do a change to your model and it has some impact in other departments or in other teams or even within your own team. Right? You want to make sure that these things are updated. So <coughs> difficult things that you can do is just set up an alarm system. Hey, there's a new update. Or maybe the alarm is not on the model update itself, but maybe the model processed some data. And then you want to let know the relevant people. Hey, the data has now been processed. It's different. So maybe you should check it out. Maybe you need to do some verification on the process data, so all these kinds of things, right? So I mentioned data quite a few times. What about the data people? Uh, and by data people, I don't mean I'm like annotators or uh, people like users. I mean data scientists, data analysts, the people that actually work with you on building this whole setup, right? Um, we're focusing mostly on machine learning here. So basically we have this narrow picture where it's about, okay, we have, to have, we have to build this machine that takes data in, processes it, and then spits data out. And then we need to know, okay, these people need to know how to put it in, and these people know, need to know how it's coming out, right? But like data is not just about you, right? It's not just your machine learning model. It comes in all kinds of different ways. Uh, it's used for all different kinds of purposes. It has 
all kinds of restrictions on it, um, legal or just internal, you know, all kinds of stuff, right? So imagine if MLOps is that little circle. Um, there is this big world of data ops that's surrounding it. And maybe this little part right there is just about you and your machine learning model. But that's the part that overlaps with what's happening with the data around it, right? And this is basically what you're looking at. I, I will just slowly go through it, so don't try to like speed to it. We, I guess I have maybe five minutes. Two? Okay. Um, so what do you start when you what do you start with when you think of a data-driven company, right? Uh, I mean, that's usually how machine learning company and companies tend to label themselves. Oh, we have machine learning, so we're data-driven, right? But what's behind that? So first of all, you need to have a strategy. Where is data coming from? How expensive it is? How much work do you have to do with it? Do you have to annotate it? Do you have to modify it? Do we have to um, protect it? Meaning, like in terms of security, because it might be stolen easily or is it publicly accessible? All these kinds of questions, right? And then, if there's um, governance problems, who owns the data? Who has the right to do this and that with the data? Uh, is it problematic with GDPR? Do we have to process it to make sure that the people that have access to it have access to it in the legally correct way? Right? Uh, once it's taken care of, um, setting up infrastructure, meaning like this is the part where you do engineering the cloud, right? Uh, setting up a data lake, maybe. That might mean like, okay, you have data coming from Google Analytics, SAP, uh, your users, sorry, data produced internally by some algorithms or in your people. Uh, all these things need to be orchestrated and the role of the data ops process is basically to ask the right questions and define those things. Um, and a data ops consultant will show up and basically ask those questions and give the typical answers or the usual solutions to solve these problems and the usual questions to come up with these problems, right? And then uh, when we show up here, this is basically the part done by, uh, usually by data engineers. So you want to set up ETLs, uh, you want to clean that data in the way that your company needs it, you want to have some quality assurance to make sure that it's actually been done properly, uh, you want to monitor what's happening, and then maybe there's some prioritization necessary or some batching. And then once that's done, then you end up with uh, APIs and visualizations that can be used by the company and its users, right? And at that step, just right here, uh, like what's happening in those areas could have been done by some model, which could be a machine learning model. And that's where MLOps is sitting in that little like it could be like one slice of multiple slices of uh, that part of the process. So what I'm trying to say here is that MLOps is actually a little part of this bigger operational nightmare, <laughs> if you do it wrong, uh, of uh, data ops. And in my personal experience, that's actually one of the main reasons why um, so many problems have been dealt with the wrong way. I, can only, I even remember my first month doing uh, machine learning, I received a SQL query of 4 million data rows, and it was called the data millionaire, right? So it gives you an idea that if you don't ask all these questions, you're basically running into a million problems not knowing what's ahead of you, right? So I hope I give you an idea of what's is surrounding the operational aspects of machine learning. And I just want to finish with a quick quote from one of our uh, ex-colleagues at Polo Squad. Uh, this is about business. This is not about technical stuff, right? So in business, the tech is easy. People are hard. So if you just want an AI model, right? If you want a machine learning model doing some predictions, you hire a machine learning engineer, give him a laptop, give him six months, poof, you have a model, right? But then, if you want that model to actually do something, be used by people, be managed by people, be designed by people, you know, be maintained by people. Uh, if you want this thing to be deployed, be uh, used, be scalable, be maintainable, this is hard because there's a lot of people involved, there's a lot of uh, users involved, there's a lot of management involved, money, right? All these things are hard to coordinate. And this is where 
these disciplines that I mentioned, like basically the data ops process and this smaller process of MLOps, this is where doing things the right way actually pays off. It's not at the technical level, it's at the organizational level. Okay. So, 